the rolling. Hallo zusammen, herzlich willkommen, welcome and greetings from Soapbox Science Düsseldorf, Germany. I hope every one of you is keeping safe and, putting, and staying put. So today we are here, gathered here to uh, present some of the leading scientists in Düsseldorf and the areas of Germany and we, they will be telling about their research. So before I begin, I am Tanvi Kera, I am a virologist here in Germany. And together with my uh, colleague Audrey, we will be hosting the English edition of the session. The event is actually organized into two different parts. The first one is the English session that will last up to 12.30. And the next session after a short break will resume with the German session beginning at around 2 p.m. Um, so fine, let's begin. So what do you know about Soapbox actually? So I will give you a little brief history about the soapbox. The soapbox date back to a long time when uh, people in the UK used to promote uh, their sort of their uh, values or about religious or political views in a form of a speaker's corner in Hyde Park. And from there, we got this idea of having a soapbox, but with the promotion or with the value of promoting women in science. So with this in mind, we started this a decade ago and promoted soapbox science. It has been uh, in various cities and for the first time in Dusseldorf we are creating we are holding this event here in our uh, city here in 2020. Um, so what exactly are we promoting is basically that there is the visibility of female scientists in science and we really want to uh, fo focus on that. And um, in traditional ways the soapbox event would have been in a public area engaging the public and making it uh, more for the kids, for everyone. You don't have to be from a science background. But due to the recent current pandemic, uh, we have moved to an online stream streaming um, platform. And there we are. So if wherever you are, just drop in a hi to say so that we know where you are streaming from. Um, all right, so when we talk about science, what usually comes to your mind? So when we talk about science, a lot of you might be engaging or might be relating it to Big Bang Theory or even Eureka or even Doctor Who. But trust me, it's much more than that. Especially during these times, scientists and also science has gained a lot of visibility as well as appreciation during the COVID times. And trust me, there is much more to that. So that's why we are here gathered and we've put together a bunch of scientists, female scientists for you, who are passionate and who wants to share the research with you. So the pandemic has really taught us about not just about the infectious disease, but also about environmental hazards, but also on the mental awareness situation. So we tried to uh, put together all the scientists from different uh, scientific background and we are uh, going to present them first. So to begin with, we have our first speaker, uh, Ms. Chiara Bruno, who is engineer specialized in renewable energy. And her mission is to help reduce CO2 emission and promote a more sustainable way of living. So I present to you here, Chiara. Thank you very much, Tanvi. And uh, thank you very much to all the Soapbox Science Dusseldorf team for organizing this event and giving me the possibility to be here today and to introduce a little bit of what my work is. And um, I really hope you guys will enjoy it. So yeah, as Tambi said, I am a renewable energy engineer. I studied in Italy, in Rome, where I come from. I studied renewable energies and then I specialized myself in sustainable energy in Stockholm, in Sweden. So um, a little bit of background about my job and my research. Uh, what is engineering? For me, engineering is application of science to reality. And uh, for me, this is very important because uh, as much as I enjoy uh, learning about science, I really enjoy the fact that science can be actually applicable to real life. And energy, why did I choose energy? I think energy is really uh, what we need 
uh, in the world. It's like we need in our day-to-day -day life. It's what our body does. Our body basically converts the energy we get from the food uh, to the energy we use for moving and for living. But also, anything you can uh, think about in your life uh, needs energy. For example, uh, if you need to charge your laptop, if you need to charge your mobile, if you need to heat up your uh, home in winter, you need energy. So you need heat and you need electricity. And uh, what is renewable? So why renewable energy? Renewable is everything that can actually be renovated uh, after we use it. So for example, if we think about sun, if we think about wind, if we use the energy from the sun today, the, the sun will still be there tomorrow for us. So the energy will be there. But if we think about, for example, coal, if we use coal, well, tomorrow we're not gonna have the same amount of coal because it takes like millions of years to, uh, to produce this coal. So coal is not a renewable source. And then I would like also to speak about sustainability because it's a little bit different. So what is sustainability? Sustainability is our ability to exist on the planet like in the same way we do today, the same day we can do it tomorrow. So to make sure that uh, our lives and our environment will be kept preserved in the next years. And everything that is destroying this is not sustainable. So exactly, for example, um, uh, CO2 emission and greenhouse gases emissions and alterating the, um, our world and alterating the atmosphere or the earth and this uh, causes climate change and this causes a lot of uh, changes in the nature meaning that basically if we co go on living like we live today we will not have the same um, earth, we will not have the same planet in a thousand years probably. We are going to destroy this planet. So. Uh, this is why I got really passionate about this topic and this is why I decided to study this and then to work into this field. Yeah, so basically to give you a bit of background also in numbers because I'm an engineer, uh, we are talking here about uh, two thirds of CO2 emissions coming from uh, fossil fuels. So coming from uh, plants that produce energy that we use every day. So we want to basically reduce this um, amount of uh, fossil fuel that are used. And we can, we can take actions in our everyday life. We can try to use less energy. We can try to buy from renewable sources. We can try to also like use less plastic, consume less, go to a more vegetarian um, eating way of life. Uh, and I decided also to carry this into my job. So uh, what do I do for job? I'll show you here. I optimize power plants like wind farms. So uh, my job is basically to make the wind farms and uh, so these uh, little wind turbines, I mean, of course they are bigger than this, uh, to make them more um, like efficient and also more um, um, cheap, cheaper, cheaper that so that we can uh, put more of them and have more energy from, uh, from them. But yeah, so today basically I would like to show you uh, a little bit of the facts about wind energy that you don't know because in Germany it's quite common to have wind energy so uh, we have still a lot but the potential can grow. So first fact I would like to uh, show today is the fact that um, are you wondering if wind energy is expensive? Well not really. So um, as a fact in the last 10 years the cost of producing uh, wind turbines and wind energy uh, went down 60%. So that's a lot. And now we are able to um, build this wind farm in a very, very um, knowledgeable, knowledgeable way. So we have the knowledge to, um, to build them, but also a lot of optimization can be done. So basically this is my job. So how can I build this in an uh, even cheaper way, in a more sustainable way, so that these plants are actually good for us, so they are not uh, harming us. For example, uh, you could have heard the fact that uh, um, wind turbines can be harmful for animals. Now let's see, birds. Yes, that's true. Sometimes birds, they fly here, like, and uh, they don't really see the blades because they are rotating quite fast. Uh, the speed at the tip of the blade can be up to uh, 90 meters per second, which is very, very fast. And yeah, it can happen that they are hit by a blade. but on these uh, two topics. First of all, unfortunately, every like building, uh, human building is affecting animals, unfortunately. And second of all, we perform always uh, environmental studies on the sites where we want to put the turbines. 
so that we are sure that if there are uh, protected birds, for example, we then we don't buy the turbines there, we don't build the turbines there. But also we have systems, for example, we can put thermo cameras on the turbines that will detect the birds and uh, they can either shut off the turbine, so it's not rotating anymore, or they can emit like sounds so the birds are scared and they don't go in the turbine. And the same we have for bats, for example. So we can stop the turbine when the bats are more active, like for example, they come out often at uh, yeah, and the sun, sunset and sunrise. So we just stop the turbines when we know the bats are going to be there. And this, of course, is reducing a lot the possibility that can crash it to the turbine. Then, yeah, another topic would be noise. Yeah, I mean, these things are noisy. Yes, they are. Every rotating equipment uh, makes noise, of course. And this is why we don't put turbines in the middle of a city because they would be too noisy. So you can be assured that actually if uh, uh, they will build a wind farm close to your place, uh, everything has been calculated so that you will not hear this noise uh, because the wind farm will be far from your house. But also um, we measure noise. We have uh, the turbines have like noise, low noise emission modes, so they can be more silent basically. And also, uh, we can shut them off in some directions. So, so if they, for example, if the wind is coming in this direction and that would make more noise for your house, then we stop it from that direction and we only produce when it's coming from another direction because the, w the turbine can um, move in this direction to follow the, the wind. Yeah, then I would like to talk a little bit about dimensions. That could be interesting. So, you know, the highest turbine in the world is actually at the moment 260 meters tall from, um, yeah, from bottom to the top. And that means, uh, um, well, if you are dialing from Germany, probably you know the Dome of Cologne, so the main cathedral, which is 176 meters, I think. So it will be some like here. So yeah, pretty big. Why do we make them bigger? Simply because they harvest more energy and the efficiency is higher. And also, uh, I would say that the environmental impact is, will be actually lower that's because with less turbine, you can produce more energy. So you will see they, they will be bigger, but you will see less of them. So that's why I also think it could be, it's very nice if we can just build them bigger, but less. And then I also would like to give you a bit of insight about uh, uh, floating wind. So uh, do you know, you probably know that there are also turbines offshore, so in the sea. Um, this is a very new technology that we are developing and it's uh, just basically instead of having a monopile like a really long uh, base which is going into the sea until the seabed, you just have some kind of uh, steel structure which is floating on the water and then the turbine is just on top of this steel structure which will be anchored to the seabed like, like a normal ship basically. And this will allow us to exploit way more sites because uh, we can go farther like out in the sea and uh, we can go where the water is more deep and also um, yeah basically where the water is deeper and means the wind is also stronger because uh, farther you go uh, from the shore and the stronger the wind and also you don't really impact the visibility or you don't impact the, um, the environment the landscape let's say. Uh, another cool thing about offshore uh, that I recently learned in my research is that um, the turbines are actually not harming the uh, environment, but uh, since it's forbidden to fish where the offshore parks are, basically um, at the top, at the bottom of the turbine, you create some kind of artificial reef, some kind of uh, artificial uh, environment for the fish, and actually the biodiversity is increasing because. Uh, fish go there to live, they are not bothered by fishermen because fishermen cannot fish them there. So actually we saw like this increase in biodiversity in the wind farms, which was kind of very, very nice. And this last topic I would like to mention is the fact that yes, probably you are wondering if renewable sources are enough to sustain us. The, que the answer is probably not, but this is why we have to develop all of these resources. So the wind, the solar, but also we have to couple them, for example, with uh, uh, storage systems, which could be as simple as batteries, like the battery you have in your cell phone, to something a bit more um, 
let's say, complicated like uh, water storage. So you can basically use the uh, excess of energy that you have sometimes to uh, pump up water from like a lower uh, level to an upper level. And then basically when you need that energy, the water flows down and uh, with a, a hydro turbine, you can produce more energy. So basically, um, yeah, you couple the wind farms with some other sources and then we want to secure basically the energy provision um, all the time. Uh, another way, for example, would be to use the excess energy because if you put a lot of wind turbines, hey, they all uh, go at the same time. Maybe you have too much energy, but you can store it, for example, uh, with hydrogen. You can produce hydrogen with the uh, electricity you have in excess from the turbine and you can use this hydrogen later for any uh, other uh, energy purpose that you might have. So there are many, many different types of uh, uh, hybrid system we can think about there. And this really needs a lot of uh, research and a lot more of uh, optimization to make it economically viable. So that's basically my job, to always try to uh, yeah, find the right way so we can put more renewable energy and be more sustainable. I hope I was in the time. <laughs> yes, you are. Grazie <laughs> mille, uh, Chiara. <laughs> that was really, really, really nice. Thank you so much. So we have some questions for you. Oh, and okay. the question is, yeah, for sure, of course. So <laughs> someone asked that uh, what nowadays is the production cost from the wind, actually? Like mm -hmm. to produce power, what is the production cost from wind yes. these days? So uh, I would say that this um, really depends on the, um, on the country. Uh, this is because, uh, of course, like um, mm, the cost of, for example, permitting the land, the cost of operating the wind farm, it's really dependent on, on the country. But I would say that uh, uh, at the moment, the cost that we have to produce uh, uh, energy from the wind uh, in some countries is even uh, lower than the cost that we have to produce energy from uh, um, turbines. So we are talking about a range that goes between uh, um, like $30 uh, dollars per megawatt hour produced okay. to like 60 euros per megawatt hour produced. It really depends on where you are doing okay. this. But uh, 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 this cost is uh, um, as foreseen to be uh, de declining in the next year and even get the wind more competitive than coal and fossil fuels. So someone was actually also um, questioning about that how is the energy transport happens from the offshore turbines to mm -hmm. the land? Yes. So what are the different ways? I think it's very interesting, right? And yes, explain. exactly. That's one of the main challenges because uh, uh, as I said before, the offshore turbines can be quite far from the shore. So uh, there is a long distance that this electricity has to um, basically to, to travel to reach the substation. So there is a substation onshore which is a place where the electricity uh, had, uh, is transferred from the offshore to the onshore grid. And basically, uh, the electricity is uh, uh, transported by a direct current. Okay. So direct current is uh, uh, a type of current that transports electricity in a, um, having less losses than the alternate current. The normal current that we have here, it's uh, alternate, but we have direct current, current cables that transport this energy from the turbines offshore. So really, really big cables, basically, that goes below uh, the sea and they transport the energy yeah, up right. to the shore. And Chiara, finally, if you could just very briefly in like two lines tell us about, because the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal by 2030 is to have a more sustainable living. Mm -hmm. So how from your field are you going to, you know, sort of translate this? And what do you kind of perceive or see that in 2030, how is it going to be? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that, uh, first of all, I, I love the fact that my company wants to grow a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would really encourage, if I could, like the government to give us even more subsidies mm -hmm. because in some governments we are actually uh, lacking subsidies now, but they are still needed. Uh, so also if, uh, if Germany, for example, put subsidies to phase out the coal, I think uh, that that's very important because then we can really focus on this renewable energy. Uh, something we can do like in our daily life is of course taking uh, small actions. For example, uh, in winter we can uh, heat up our apartment two degrees less and this is already a big impact for the environment. We can choose to buy from renewable energy uh, um, electricity providers. This might be a little bit more expensive but it's very good for the uh, environment. And we can, in general, I think that really everybody in our day-to-day -day life can make small actions to, to make the world a better place. Perfect.
Very nice. Thank, Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, so moving on. What do we have next? So we have from an engineer, we move on to an immunologist. So we present to you Ms. Panayota Marmorelli or Naya, maybe I call her Naya, so we all can just refer her to as Naya. So Naya is actually an immunologist with the focus on, um, on autoimmune diseases. She's currently doing her postdoctoral research at the Medicine um, University in Mainz. And uh, before this, she has been involved in various science communication activities. For example, she was the recipient of the first prize at the FAME lab in the Lower Saxony and was also uh, uh, awarded to be present at the German level. So I present to you Naya, who actually presented her science communication in only three minutes. But today, I'm hoping to hear more Naya. Okay. The stage is yours. Good morning, uh, Tanvi, and thanks a lot for allowing me to be part of Sopok Science in Dusseldorf. So as she kindly introduced me, uh, I am working with uh, our immune system and how uh, its actions affect autoimmune diseases. So uh, my main interest is on uh, T cells. These are uh, small cells of our immune system that are mostly important in order to defend our bodies against um, pathogens, microbes that are gonna harm ourselves or even uh, chemicals. So there are several categories uh, that uh, mostly uh, we can divide them into two major so that it's more easy for you to understand. And I chose some colors so that it's easier also to, um, to remember them. So the ones that are actually important in order to defend ourselves from uh, bad agents, microbes, chemicals, allergens, and whatever, they're called effector T cells. And um, yeah, as red colors use a little bit more um, aggressive, let's say, um, I chose uh, this ball just to, to uh, resemble them. Um, so these are very important. Once a, a foreign agent comes to our body, they have to recognize it, activate and start fighting it. On the other side, uh, when these uh, guys are no longer needed because the bacteria or um, the um, virus is eliminated, we have some diplomats in our immune system, those so-called anti-inflammatory cells that tell uh, our effector cells to shut down their um, action, their, their, their weapons. So it is really important those two guys to stay in a balance uh, because you don't want way too many of them when there is nothing wrong uh, trying to enter our body. But on the other side, when you have an infection, you don't want these guys to be so many that they could just stop them. You really need to find a way in order to balance them. Um, there are other examples, like for example in tumors, you don't have enough of the effector cells in order to fight the tumor cells. You, you have a lot of the anti-inflammatory and this causes a lot of troubles to uh, the treatment of uh, cancer patients. Same thing uh, happens also in autoimmunity, where you have a lot of effector cells actually targeting your own system. It's like a civil war that needs to be shut down. So what uh, in my projects are trying, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to find ways in order to balance uh, these um, guys here, either to promote more of the effector cells when you need to fight a persisting infection, or uh, to limit them by inducing more of the diplomats of our immune system in order to reduce the inflammation when it's no longer needed or when it's unwanted in the cases of autoimmunity. Um, like people suffering uh, from inflammatory uh, bowel disease or from rheumatoid arthritis or even in the cases of allergy and um, other unwanted uh, auto-inflammatory conditions. Um, someone would ask how, some, how we can do it. There are a lot of drugs out there that do this job, however they're not uh, specific. They act not only on, on our immune system but at the same time they also act on other uh, cells of our body. In my lab, we are trying to find natural compounds that could actually influence this balance without having uh, severe side effects. And upon a screening of a natural uh, metabolites from a bacterium from the soil, from, from the earth, earth, I don't know uh, how um, I always miss the German word for that, um, we came up with one uh, compound called Zorafen that can actually do this job. Zorofen actually tells the cells to change their appetite. So here we, we come back to energy, uh, just like our previous uh, speaker uh, talk, but 
more about the energy of the individual cells now. Uh, the effector cells uh, are mostly relying on a lot of fat. They need fat in order to be able to fight the pathogens, uh, to um, proliferate and become more, because you need more soldiers when there is an infection going on. And in order to uh, stop them, what we do is that uh, this compound actually starves them from fats. It, it prevents them from being able to eat fats and um, use them. On the other side, these um, anti-inflammatory diplomats don't really rely on fat. And since both of them take the, from the environment the same signals, this L energy availability is really a key that can control this balance. So Zorofen can inhibit uh, our effector uh, inflammatory cells, but at the same time, since there is more um, nutrients available, uh, our anti-inflammatory cells can be able to um, become more powerful and stop um, our inflammatory cells. So it was already uh, shown that in models of inflammatory bowel disease, the, the Zorofen could actually reduce um, in life uh, the inflammatory cells and also in cultures um, and at the same time increase the amount of uh, anti-inflammatory diplomats. And of course, um, there's still a lot of work in order to be able to give it to humans, but um, we are still working on that and um, we hope that this compound of us could eventually be able to treat people with autoimmune diseases. So I don't know if um, people would like to give us more um, questions or to explain a little bit more um, about um, our compound or perhaps share their feedback on like, if there's someone that Thanks a lot, Maya. I hope I wasn't too. <laughs> no, it was, it was really perfect. Don't worry. Okay. Was, don't you just have to be very relaxed? It's a okay. laid-back Saturday, so make yourself very comfortable. Yes, yes, yes. There's Sometimes like this, um, yeah, <laughs> I was used to, to trying to force with these three minutes usually because in the street people are coming, going, yeah, and they cannot stay true. longer. But now no, with but because we are trying to also engage people who mm -hmm. don't belong from the science background, because usually they don't really don't know, you know, what yes, a scientist know, does. Because for them, it's always Eureka, you know, and that's not usually the yes. case. Because we know behind the scenes what exactly is happening. This is why they should. We yeah, should, they should, should do it. <laughs> come more, more. Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, it's it's nice that we have this event no, so that sure. people can actually. Uh, get into okay so while we're waiting for actually i had a question yes. because you mentioned about the sorafen right yes and um so do you can you mention what are the side effects of sorafen for so um it had been shown in high concentrations i mean it's it's the dose that makes the poison first of all for every kind of uh, either um uh, drugs that are uh, produced in a laboratory or even uh, natural um, compounds that are can used as, as uh, medication drugs, uh, it's always about the dose. Mm -hmm. Zorofen in very small amounts can, uh, in uh, in vitro cultures where we, we took the cells, our immune cells, and um, tried to see the effect of it on them, uh, it was really effective in low concentrations, so the more it might be toxic. However, uh, when someone checks, uh, checks about side effects, don't only check about toxicity, but also side effects on other cells and um, yeah, or like the tissue, if it's uh, affected or... So we did do a screening. Uh, as I said, I applied it into um, in vivo models using um, mice. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if, if uh, this might make some people uh, feeling uncomfortable with that, but it's, it's one way that we can actually test whether in humans it could be applied. Yeah. So we checked and it didn't seem to, harm, to have any negative effects on the quality of life of the treated mice. Uh, it affected not only our uh, effector T cells but other inflammatory cells that play also a role in the um, uh, fight against pathogens but uh, to an extent that this wouldn't um, make our immune system not uh, strong enough to fight infections. So it really uh, improved the, um, the disease um, symptoms. It, it reduced the symptoms of uh, E. colitis in mice, but it didn't really affect uh, 
to a great extent uh, are the functions of uh, mm -hmm. the animals. Tanaya, because we talk so much about, you know, coronavirus these days, yes. right? And then we are always like, what are the drugs coming up? Is it the remetosphere or is it this or is it that? And mm -hmm. I guess we as, you know, like biologists, we always get questions like what's the new yes. thing in happening? So I don't know if I am right, if I'm, if I'm not right, just correct me because even sorafin was used for at least in HCC in hepatocellular, like in yeah, the cancer are of are liver, some, no. maybe, but but is it also for specific for more viral? Uh, I think there was a um, there was a group actually in our area where we did our PhD okay. in Hanover yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that were actually trying to use orofen for antiviral responses. Yeah. I I have to say that I'm not yet very um, informed about the results, okay. um, but it someone would ex uh, expect that uh, the compound will act on cells that are starving for, for fat okay. because it blocks this n desire for, for fat. So, and I, I assume that, um, yeah, to some, uh, it depends on the pathogen. Okay. So it depends also on the virus and what kind of uh, cells, as you know better as a virologist, it would, um, like it will irritate, let's say, in yeah. order to, um, yeah, for them to start the fight so against they suffer, it. Basically yes. In them. Yeah. Cool. It's very good. But regarding the corona, please don't forget to wear your mask. <laughs> it's a must. It's the new uh, fashion trend. So, um, so Naya, we have a, sh a one question over yes. here where they mention about. How are the compounds screened? You know, like how do they look? All right. For the so and there's um, a rider to that. That are you running lab experiments or is it mainly computer stimulation? No, it's actually um, uh, lab work that we do. We had the collaboration uh, with chemists in uh, the Hel Helmholtz Centrum in Braunschweig, where they actually isolated uh, from us the individual uh, compounds from uh, that bacterium from the soil. And we had like pure, um, in a powder form, uh, the pure products separately. And then uh, we isolate, we just isolate the cells either from uh, human blood or from uh, mice. And uh, we culture them in the presence of the individual compounds in different concentrations. And in that way, we can titrate the effect to see in which concentration uh, and above it might be toxic for the cells and uh, which is the minimum concentration that you can actually see an effect on the function of the cells without actually killing them. So this is how we select uh, not only compounds that can affect directly the um, uh, effector uh, T lymphocytes, we can also, uh, we try to find uh, also compounds that could be used as adjuvants uh, for vaccination pro um, processes. Mm -hmm. So that's how we do it. Once we find a compound, like a candidate that it's uh, promising, then we dive more into the mechanism, how exactly it affects. For example, Zorofen was also known from uh, previous studies from uh, plant biologists and um, bac microbiologists, uh, it, it act its action. Um, but not in immune cells. It was more known how it affects bacteria. Uh, so we also addressed the mechanism on how it affects um, human cells. And uh, addressing the mechanism then uh, led to us testing whether it also has side effects on the desired cells or on other cell populations that are important for us and yeah. Okay. And one last one, someone asked about the effector types. Are there different effector types or yes. depending so, on the different um, pathogen for instance? The different uh, pathogens of course elicit like induce different responses. This is a way of our uh, body to have a more specific and strong uh, response towards them. Um, for example, um, T817 cells, uh, the cells that I'm more interested in, uh, the effector, these, the red ones, um, are for extracellular pathogens or fungi, um, responsible for uh, eliminating them, and you can find them um, in a great amounts in the intestine. Uh, at the same time, you also have the Th1 cells or Th2 that play a role in asthma or uh, lung infections. Um, so each individual uh, cell uh, population is responsible for killing uh, different path or uh, defending ourselves against different pathogens. 
something that someone has to mention though is that there is a kind of a flexibility between that. They don't uh, uh, decide a fate a hundred percent. They can still be um, discussed and uh, change according to the environment slightly. Um, so if there is a, a, a demand for uh, a a TH1 um, uh, response, the TH17 cells can also um, start producing the weapons that the TH1 uh, cells do. Uh, Zorofen though had a more uh, generic effect on effector T cells in general and not regulatory, so it makes it a nice candidate to uh, overall uh, affect um, effector T cells that are implicated in uh, uh, autoimmune diseases because it's you usually have Th1 and Th17 effector cells um, fighting a lot uh, during autoimmune uh, diseases. So, um, yeah, it gives a little bit more wider effect, but um, it's enough to, to, mi uh, to minimize the inflammation. Cool. Thanks a lot, Naya. Thank it was really you. nice and having you here. <laughs> it was really nice your to, experience. to, to uh, be part of it. And, uh, yeah, I look forward for the next sessions. Yes, sure. Good. Thank you. Bye, people. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So from uh, an immunologist, what do we move next to? So let's go to the brain. And it's a very interesting talk, actually. So it's by Dr. Manuel Arcelletto, who is a comparative in, in the Department of Comparative Psychology at the Institute of Experimental Psychology at the Heinrich Heine University here in Dusseldorf. And her topic is apple or candy. For you or for me, let the brain choose. It's a difficult choice, but I guess Manuela will help us answer this. So Manuela, the stage is yours. I'm arriving. Yes, <laughs> we're waiting. So thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction and also for organizing this amazing event. Uh, well, hello, my name is Manuela and uh, I am a researcher in cognitive neuroscience here uh, at the University of Dusseldorf. Um, what I study um, has something to do with what I think is the most fascinating organ in our body, uh, which is the brain. Uh, if you're not familiar with the brain uh, itself, um, here I have Rita. She's willing to show us her brain. Um, so you can see um, half of the brain here and the right half uh, here. I don't know if you can actually see from the, the camera. Um, and if you're curious to see how it would look like from the outside, um, here it is. So this would be our brain from the outside. So you have to imagine something pinkish, uh, wrinkly, um, and also squishy, so it is not hard uh, as this one. Now, um, as everything in our body, um, the brain is made of cells, and I need another prop here. Um, so this is only a puppet, uh, but it well serves the idea of what our brain is made of. So this cell is called neuron. Um, we do have different um, types of neurons in our brain because they have different functions, uh, but this is one of the typical ones. So it has something that is called a body, so this part here. Then this has a long tail, which is called axon. And then there are other uh, branches, uh, which basically allow um, each neuron, so each cell, to communicate with other cells. Um, what is important here for you to know is that these are super, super small and it is even estimated that we have in our brain up to uh, 100 billion of these cells. So you might um, imagine that our uh, brain is extremely complex. Um, we cannot, so only one person cannot study everything related to the brain, so all functions that the brain can uh, subserve. Um, to explain you what I study, and what I do is basically uh, look at the brain and understand how us, um, as humans, um, make decisions. And to, do, to understand that, I'm going to make you an example. So, um, imagine yourself uh, that you are in your afternoon break um, and you want to have a snack. Uh, I'm pretty sure, so you can imagine right now, and I'm pretty sure that um, some of you might go for a chocolate bar, uh, some other might go for a fruit salad, and others might even go for an energy drink. Maybe you still have work to do, uh, study to do, so you need some energy. What is important here for you to know and also to remember for the rest of the talk is that um, we all make different decisions. So remember that. Now, um, 
I'm gonna give you um, a similar example, but a little bit more specific. Now, imagine that there is a person who is on a diet um, and uh, she has to make your very same decision. She is on her um, afternoon break, she, uh, she has to decide what to eat. And she has in front of her two options, and I need my props here. So, um, she has in front of her two things. Uh, she can either have uh, some of these candies, uh, they even have a brain shape, so she really loves this. Uh, they're her favorite candies. Um, on the other hand, uh, she can have an apple. Now, um, you might uh, guess that, remember, she's on a diet, right? Um, if she chooses the candies, um, these are not a very healthy choice, because candies have a lot of sugar, or at least more than an apple, and so this will not help her uh, with her future goal of uh, losing weight. Um, whereas if she goes for the apple, now the apple has um, a little more uh, neutral taste, but um, it is definitely better for her diet, because in the long term she will uh, lose weight. Um, now you might have heard in the news the word uh, self-control. Um, we might we can say that if this person remember she's on a diet, goes for the candies. Um, this person is, has low self-control, so she is a bit impulsive because she's giving into temptation of something that is very tasteful right now, um, but she's losing her uh, long-term goal, so she's forgetting that in the long term she wants to lose weight. On the other hand, if she goes for the apple, yeah, she doesn't get uh, much now, but um, she will get something in the future, so she is self-controlled. Now, um, what I do, um, to study this um, is to have participants, so you have to imagine people, um, usually my participants are uh, young adults, uh, they come to a special place uh, where there is this large tube. Uh, this is called a scanner. Uh, you can also imagine to be uh, my participants actually. So you arrive at the lab, uh, you lay down on a bed within this large tube, so within this scanner, and what I'm able to do is to make pictures at the brain of my participants when they are making these choices. Uh, so this is a very loud machine, uh, so I usually give earplugs to my participants, uh, so everything is fine. They lay down, they see on this screen um, a series of choices. Um, to be honest, most of my studies involve money more than food, um, because it's more easy uh, to study. Uh, you know, to make this, mm, to ask decisions with money, but this example well serves uh, the idea. So now imagine a lot of participants, because uh, we never test only one person, and this person never only makes one choice. We do need many participants, and each of these participants has to make a lot of choices. Now, um, what do I get uh, when these participants are in the scanner? I'm showing you. So, as I anticipated, uh, I make, uh, is there any problem? I make uh, pictures to the brain, um, and this is how it looks like. So I'm not sure these are really small, whether you can uh, look from, from there. So remember the first model that I showed you of the brain. So this looks pretty similar, right? It's like we are looking at the brain from the middle. Um, whereas this one is a bit more uh, from the lateral surface, so from the outside. Um, this is not what actually a, a brain looks like, so you have to imagine that this is not one person, this is more person one over the other. Uh, remember, I have to ask the same questions to many people to understand what's going on in the brain. And most importantly, uh, we do not have in the brain this uh, colored spot. You might have also seen this again um, in the news or, or newspapers. Um, this happen I get uh, this colored spot only when I then go uh, to my office, I sit in front of the computer, it might look like, it might sound um, a bit boring, uh, but actually it's really fun. I do analyze um, the data that I collected, meaning, uh, I look at the um, uh, behavior of my participants, so the choices of my participants. Apple or candies, uh, are they on a diet or are they not? And also, um, I look at what was happening in the brain while my participants were making the choice. 
So the color is basically a way that the computer, let's say, that the software um, allows me to see where in the brain, um, wh what parts in the brain were actually participating, so they were engaged in making the decision. Um, I don't know if you, uh, if I'm able to share with you the feeling um, that this is really interesting for me. So I'm really excited when I get these pictures and um, to be honest this is also enough for me to, to do science. Um, however, uh, you might wonder whether this is even useful. I mean, yeah, besides rewarding myself, is this useful? Why do we need to know what's happening in the brain uh, when participants are choosing apple or candies? Now, if you remember, um, um, as I said before, um, we all make different decisions. This is very important because if I can look at more um, brains um, of participants who are making decisions, I'm actually able to see what makes the difference between one person and another. So what is different from this person who is on a diet and can choose the apple uh, as compared to this other person who is on a diet but is choosing the, um, uh, the candies. So once we know what is the difference between one brain and another, let's say, so how one brain is functioning and how the other one is functioning, we basically know how to help people who have low self-control to actually be able, let me oversimplify, to choose the apple if they are on a diet. And um, I might give you an example so that you can um, actually understand why this could be useful. Researchers before me have found out that if we uh, think about the future, um, this helps uh, people, let me again oversimplify, choose the apple over the candies. Uh, now, uh, why is that? You might wonder, yeah, that is because they are thinking about the future, right? So they are representing better their future goal, losing weight, and so they are better able to go for the apple and the candies. And this is totally true. However, what you might not know is that um, the reason for this really lies, uh, lays sorry, um, in the brain. Mm, meaning uh, that uh, when uh, participants are choosing, or when you are choosing actually, between an apple and candies, among the several regions that are activated in our brain uh, that makes you make the choice, there is this part here in the front. Uh, it has a very long name, but we can call it uh, frontal um, part of the brain. Um, this part is basically able to take into account a lot of information like uh, how much do you like the apple? How much do you like the candies? Are you on a diet or you're not? Um, maybe how hungry are you? Maybe you are on a diet but right now you are not hungry so it might still be easy to choose the apple and many other things like uh, how far away is the end of the diet um, and so on. Now, why thinking about the future helps participants making better, let's say, better choice or at least go for the apple instead of the candies? Because when we think about the future, among the regions, once again, that are um, activated so that they're engaged um, in this um, um, action, there is, once again, the region here in the front. So it's basically like when we um, ask participants to think about the future, we're basically training this frontal um, part to better represent all the information that this region needs uh, to make the good decision. Now, uh, I don't know if there are questions. Okay, then I can stop here for now. Thank you. Otherwise, I would go on. Yeah, you can actually go on as well. So no, it's fine. You can actually go on with some of your pictures because uh, there was someone yeah. who said that probably if you could focus on your picture. Sorry. Keep forgetting this. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you can actually focus on her pictures and if she can explain it better because I think yeah. there were a lot of people <coughs> who didn't really, um, yeah. you know, could, can't see and if you can really like show it because... Yes, of course. So as I said, first of all, this is not one brain. Mm -hmm. It's more pictures of many part uh, of the brains of many participants, one over the other. So this is why you get this smooth um, image. You don't really uh, get to see uh, very well the, the okay. structures. And these colors, so th they are not in our brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is just um, a sort of trick, a visual trick, okay. to um, that the, the software that the computer um, um, uses to tell me what are these regions in the brain mm -hmm. that are participating to this, uh, to this decision. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if 
I have to say, for example, what is this um, activity? What does this so activity actually, mean? Yeah. So there was a rider to this actually. Uh -huh. So someone mentioned that do you see these activities only during the scanning or after that? No, so uh, only during the scanner. Right, so okay. the participant has to be in, on this bed mm -hmm. um, with this large tube around okay. the head. Um, she has, so the participant has a sort of screen, let's mm -hmm. say. She reads the questions and she presses buttons to answer to the questions. Okay. Uh, and only in that moment, the scan so this tube is a, so this machine is able to make pictures um, they are not just the pictures that we make with our uh, smartphones or with our cameras <laughs> so these are actually pictures of the activity in okay. the brain uh, to oversimplify we might say that um, what is the activity in the brain so um, in, in, in our previous talk we have heard that cells needs uh, to eat cells need to eat uh, like you like us right mm -hmm. so we have we need energy so we need food so the cells uh, use uh, oxygen mm -hmm. so this machine is somehow able to detect which parts of the brain are using more oxygen so if okay. they are using more uh, it means that they are engaged um, in the action Okay, so there is another one just coming in that someone asks, what causes decision paralysis? Uh, decision paralysis? Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert of that. I don't know. Right. I cannot okay. answer. Sorry. Probably someone but I will really definitely look to. at that. <laughs> so uh, there is one more that have you looked at the effect of any drugs, example, alcohol on the brain activity when making decisions? So not personally, okay. uh, but um, this is a, a question very, very related to the kind of decision that I make. Mm -hmm. um, Let's assume, wh where do I have to go? <laughs> um, so um, what I study, so this kind of decision between something uh, that I can get right now, so the taste of the candies, and something that, that I can get only in the future, like losing weight. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it has been shown that, uh, Im always imagine examples that uh, involve money, first yeah. of all. Sure. Um, and it has been shown that people who uh, are actually addicted to several drugs and also alcohol, mm -hmm. um, they are very bad at making these decisions. Okay. So they really uh, cannot, um, let's say, they are not patient, uh, so they cannot wait for, um, to get a future um, reward or a future outcome. So they really want something right now. All right. So they are really, um, they are deemed as impulsive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so actually because you spoke about the cost, so actually there's uh, something we all wonder that somewhere we kind of saw that people will pick up something which is free of worse quality or something of very small quantity, but of better quality. Is this true? Uh, yes, it is true. Um, uh, once again, this is um, a, a different type of decision. Uh, this might uh, be related. So it, of course, involves the brain. Uh, sure. And uh, I'm pretty sure, uh, so I've never studied this, but I'm pretty sure it, it ranks again, involves, involves this um, the frontal part of the brain, okay. because this is really the part of the brain that um, um, gives value to things. So it might be that for some persons, it's um, it has a bi higher value uh, something that is free but worse cost mm -hmm. than something that is um, uh, you know expensive but of a better cost but this of course it's not only about uh, a matter of brain right yeah. it also um, uh, matters whether uh, you have a high income okay, or not yeah. and these <laughs> are actually by the way all variables that we take into account sure. when we make these decisions so it's you one of them exactly so you might mm, uh, you know guess that uh, a person who is uh, who has a high income is much better at um, um, following her diet because she has more uh, mm, like availability of like alternatives uh, yeah. you know mm, not only just the apple or mm, bad candies that's true yeah oh, great. cool thanks that's a lot nice. thank you very much. and uh, it was really nice and very thank intriguing you. and i think there'll be a lot of questions popping in so if you guys have any mm -hmm. questions we are going to post the handles from manuela but also from our previous speakers so feel free just drop in your questions anytime during the whole time they're very friendly scientists they're not going it's to true. give you evil looks <laughs> Please feel free, really, at any point of time to ask them questions. Because as I always said, that no question is stupid. And this is now your time to ask the questions. Thanks a lot, Manuela. Thank you very much. It's really lovely having you organizing. here. Thank yeah. you. Cool. So actually, we thought that probably we need some food for thought. So I thought maybe of dropping a sort of a science fact. So uh, we talk about science and we talk about Nobel laureates, right? So do you actually know how many Nobel laureates have been there? So just for information, there are around 950 Nobel laureates known, and out of which only 53 are women. 
and from these 53, only Marie Curie is one who received the Nobel Laureate twice. I just thought it was a good food for thought, if you might not know. So some housekeeping instru uh, instructions for our speakers as well as for our viewers. Please keep popping in your questions at any point of time. We will try to ask all, of your, uh, all our speakers about your questions, about your interests. And as I said, just you can also type in their uh, Twitter handle, Insta handle, or LinkedIn page, or on the Facebook page, and we will try and answer all your questions. But as of now, it's a Saturday, so just late, uh, it's a laid back Saturday, so like sit there and enjoy a fun ride on a soapbox um, train, I would say. Uh, so now we will have a little um, stop over here because we are trying to um, get in our next speaker who will um, join us from Hanover. And uh, there will be a pause for a minute or so, and then we will be back. So we will join her on Zoom. So, yeah.
to speak. All right. Hi, I'm not the next speaker though, I'm sorry, because we've had some technical issues and I'm, I really apologize for that. But as you know, you know, we're still learning and science is all about learning, evolving. So we're still trying to figure out how to get Veronica from Hanover to Dusseldorf via Zoom. And it might just take a bit longer. So uh, meanwhile, I guess I would say it's already 12.15. So maybe you guys can go grab a lunch and we do the same. And we come back in the next session, but we start the next session a bit earlier. So we start at 1.40. So 20 minutes before the scheduled um, German session, we will have Veronica. She's a very, very, very happy and a very uh, knowledgeable uh, person. And I'm pretty sure that you guys will also uh, feel the same when we stream her online on uh, at 1.40. So see you guys there. And I really apologize.